Aloha, everyone. Um, wanted to go live a little bit early just to get all the bugs worked out. And um, the issue was I was using Safari browser instead of Google Chrome. So now I'm on Google Chrome. It's all good. Can you guys hear me? And uh, yeah, I'm a little early, so I'll wait and start kind of talking about the big stuff. Um when I said I would start. Say what's up in the chat if you can hear me. Oh, James says, yep, it's a good name. Um, it, it might get a little loud and I might disappear for a second to close up the hatches. There's somebody like cleaning the bottom on the next boat over. Um, middle of a Sunday afternoon here in Honolulu. So um, if it gets loud, I might disappear for a second and close everything up, but a little muggy today. So I, I would rather not. Oh, there's lots of Jameses in the house on the chat. Um, so hello, Kate. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit about stuff that's happening and pop back and forth. Um, Please forgive me if the chat gets overwhelming and I can't keep up with all the questions. Um, my dear friend Sarah is going to be moderating the chat um, and my little brother Scott might pop on, but Sarah will kind of be on troll patrol. Oh, there's Captain Mike. What's up, Captain Mike? And um, so, yeah, let me uh, talk about some sort of like recent stuff that's going on, some in the near future stuff, and uh, then we'll kind of go from there. Um, I had the very most recent thing is I had a podcast interview on profoundly pointless podcast. Um, I've included that, that, um, link in the description of this video, but I'll go ahead and post it here as well. Um, and, uh, that was fun. I want to thank Kevin for having me on that podcast. Um, we sat and talked for a while and, um, I'm happy with the way it came out. So go over and check that out. He does a pretty cool podcast format where <clears throat> he just interviews people with unusual lives, like everything from like dominatrixes to professional curling athletes to you name it, like a lot of sort of just very unusual lives. Um, so he finds people and, and sits down and talks to them. So check out, check out his podcast. Um, what else? Uh, oh, I also did like the, man, I can't remember the day before the day after I did the um, profoundly point, pointless podcast. I interviewed with Trish and Kevin of Room 104 um, out of Dublin, uh, 104 FM in Dublin. And that, I'm not sure when that one's coming out, maybe next week. That's like a weekday show, but um, I'll post the link to their thing. And um, we spoke for about an hour. I'm not sure what they'll edit it down to, but um, that was fun to sit and visit with them. And um, that kind of gets me on to like where those two interviews came from was um, some of you may have seen Unilad Adventure posted like kind of like a Cliff Notes version of my passage video on their Facebook pages, um, both on the Unilad Adventure Facebook page and on the Unilad Australia Facebook page. And um, I think the Unilad Adventure, I don't have Facebook, so I haven't even seen it, but um Last time Sarah checked for me, I think it was like 8 million views in like a week on that one. So that's crazy. And then like one and a half million views on the Australia one. So that's pretty fun. Um, a one funny thing about it is like I had thought like the whole time because they had contacted me. Unilad had contacted me about posting it and got me to sign off on it before I even reached a million on the passage video. So they contacted me and like let's see, like November or something. And um, then I just never heard anything about it again. And then it came out recently and um, with like 8 million views, almost 10 million views combined between their two things, I've seen almost no bump on my YouTube channel, which is so crazy. It's like there have been some subscribers, but in relation to my regular sort of traffic, there was no spike, which is very strange. And maybe people just thought that was the whole story and they saw the whole story, which is fine. Or maybe it's just a matter of like people that watch that enjoyed, you know, I don't know how long the clip was, but it was probably under five minutes, you know? So maybe like, it was like 
short story versus war and peace um version so um but yeah it's pretty fun have more more eyes on the on the story um let me check in on the uh thing hello from poland um yeah thanks everybody for popping in and, and saying hi um so what else uh so the you know, we talked about the unilad thing um what else is going on uh oh this is pretty fun is it what time is it it's 304 okay um i have a big feature coming up in cruising world magazine um that should be i think it's going to be in the may issue of cruising world last i heard uh the writer david blake fisher is writing the feature uh and it's all a go and um yeah i'm excited to see that in print um and to see what he, he writes he uh just received an award for his story in good old boat magazine about his boat delilah that he bought you can find him on instagram at sailing delilah uh sarah will you post uh, a link to sailing delilah's instagram account in the chat right now um but yeah so i want to thank david for like He's the one that made it happen. Like he reached out, he wrote like a sort of like a pitch to them and they said yes. And then we sat down and did a long interview. And so he, he, um, he really came to me with it and I'm very grateful. So it's pretty exciting to have a feature coming out in that magazine. <clears throat> um, so that's cool. And then also the, um, I've been speaking with Good Old Boat about writing for them, and um, their editor contacted me back and said yes, they they want to um, they want to have me um, write some at least at least an article and hopefully multiple articles about Tritea's refit. So they're really um, a lot of the stuff they like to focus on are like old boats and like refit and mechanics and that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> I've written I just did the second draft, finished it today. Um, of a story that will hopefully be coming out in that magazine um, talking about the early days of the refit for Tritea. And if that's well received with the magazine, then I plan on doing a lot more sort of heavily specific articles in the magazine about the compression post and enclosing the head on Tritea, about the integral water tank that I made, about you name it, all these crazy custom things that I did to Tritea. So hopefully that that turns into a number of articles for that magazine. And um yeah, I'll be stoked on that. So that's happening. Um, what else? Somebody's asking, how's the new battery system working out? Uh, I just actually got the... Okay, so anyone that's on here that doesn't know, uh, because I guess I made the one video, but um, Dakota Lithium sponsored me and um, supplied me with two beautiful 200 amp hour battery so now 400 amp hours of lithium battery and i'm in the process of converting everything over and then converting into an electric galley um, i'll go ahead and post their link real quick and um i have been waiting for a month for a class t 400 amp class t fuse i found a place i've been waiting longer than that but i found a place that said they had them in stock i ordered two of them so i'd have a spare and then i waited a month and then finally i called them there oh no we haven't had that since november so it like wasted a month of my life and pushed the project on hold for a month. And I only had one battery hooked up. Well, the other day I just went ahead and hooked and, and finished the install of the batteries with an ANL fuse, um, which is not good for lithium, but <clears throat> it'll be okay in the short term until I can find one of these class T 400 amp fuses. They're just kind of out of stock worldwide because of part shortages. So that yeah, I got I got held back a little bit on that full install, but I've been filming the whole process. And yesterday, I in, I don't know if it was yesterday. In the last couple of days, I installed my Victron Energy Multi Plus Two Thousand Inverter Charger. So that was like a big job that I was worried about. Um, and uh, yeah, oh, there's my little brother, Scott Tillery. Uh, Mist Valiant is on here. <clears throat> um, so, so yeah, um, I'm stoked on the Dakota. It's going to be bananas, but, um, I really, until I get the galley fully installed electric, that's when I'll kind of know about the performance versus replenishment with the solar, um, Renogy solar, which I haven't announced this like, uh, 
on YouTube yet, but Renogy also sponsored Tritea. And so I upgraded my solar from 200 watts to 400 watts with Renogy panels. And they sent me a 3000 watt inverter that'll be the dedicated inverter for the new galley. And um, so that video is coming out in like two weeks um, for the uh, solar upgrade. And um, so I'm stoked on that. That's going to help. I mean, it's doubling my solar. And then with lithium, since it charges, you know, what, four, four times faster or something, five times faster. So, you know, that'll help a lot. Um, but I'll, I'll know more about it. You know, once I get into seeing what the electric galley does, me being solo, I don't cook much. I don't eat much. Um, so I don't I don't think the drawdown is going to be crazy. But, you know, we'll see what the I'm going to definitely log the performance and <clears throat> what makes sense so that other people can learn from my experience and share that with everyone as I go. Um, I'll also be trying, I'm going to try to buy a um, Honda 2000 watt inverter charger, you know, like little generator. One of my viewers actually offered me an old one several months ago before all this was going down. And um, I just didn't think I had room for it. I thanked him, but I was like, I just don't think I have room to stow it because I, I didn't see an immediate need. And now I need to find one. So I'm going to try to buy one of those so that I have one in case I'm like in overcast for a long time. And I'm, and I really need it, you know? Um, so yeah. And again, I'm sorry if I'm missing this stuff, like, uh, my little brother, Scott and Sarah can kind of speak for me in the chat. If, if they see questions that they know the answers to. Um, so, so yeah, that's what's happening with the lithium upgrade. I'm super stoked. Um, and then what else? Uh, what else? I don't know. You guys have any questions? Let me see what I had some notes here, but I'm not good at. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, yeah. So you guys have any questions about what I'm talking about? Hmm. Uh, Joe's asking how I have a setup for Jerry Kins on the four deck. I'm probably just going to do a board on the between the stanchions. I didn't actually have any need for it on my last passage. I like to keep the deck as clear as possible and I actually can stow all of my diesel cans down in the, um, like in one of the cockpit lockers. <clears throat> I don't like storing gasoline obviously down below. And so I'm definitely going to want to take some, so those will get stored on deck somewhere, but for the most part, I don't have to store them on deck, which is good because then it keeps stuff from getting slammed by waves and, and reduces windage. Um, truth make QQ ask, is my bottom clean? That's a dirty question. Um, so, uh, what's Kimberly up to? Kimberly might pop on here in a minute. She's in Mozambique and, um, she said she was going to set an alarm and try to get on and say hi. Um, but it's like three in the morning for her. So, but she's doing good. She's in Tofu, Mozambique. And, um, yeah, she's having fun and um, doing some research and just exploring Africa. Um, so, yeah. And then, yeah, Scott's talking about I had the bottom done before I left. I'm also going to be hauling out April 28th. The boat yard here was backed up. I think I mentioned this before, but the boat yard was backed up four months. So, April 28th is my haul out date to do the final repair on the rudder. And um, Captain Mike gave me some bottom paint. So I'm going to be doing some uh, couple coats of bottom paint on it at the same time just to go ahead. And the bottom paint's really good still, but I want to go ahead and get it topped up while she's out. Um, Danny's is asking, when do I plan to go south and reasons? Uh, in May, that's the season, is like after April. But mostly it's like, yeah, I'll be leaving in May sometime, depending on, you know, with everything with the rudder. And then I'll do sea trials between here and Maui and explore Maui and do a bunch of filming, get the editing done. And then I'll push off for the Tuamotus in French Polynesia. Um. What else? Let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, yeah, I did G G 
Uh, I did G10 backing plates for all my through holes, and they're awesome. Um, no, I probably will not. I don't. I don't know if I'll sell Tritea to the Big Island, just because there's so few anchorages that crossing the is it the Ali New Haha? Is that the name of that channel? Is so brutal that I'm not sure it's worth it. But maybe I will. I could just depart from there because it actually moves me closer to where I want to be and gets me kind of further in the right wind direction. But I'd like to go over there and see Paul Exner. Um, I've always wanted to see his boat and he runs charters out of there. So I'd like to pop over there for that. But it just depends. Um, JD's asking, will COVID restrictions affect your route? Yeah, absolutely. And originally I'd hoped to sell from here to Kiribati, but <laughs> Kiribati was open for like, a total of about five days. Um, they had been locked down, even not even letting their citizens come back through the whole pandemic. They're open for like five days. A plane full of Mormon missionaries comes back and brought 34 cases of COVID to the island. And uh, they're in actual lockdowns now. And I don't expect them to be open for a year. So I'd wanted to go there. It would have been an easier, shorter passage. But now it looks like I'll just be going to the two Motus. French Polynesia is open. I'm not sure. Hopefully the Cook Islands will be open. Um, by the time I get down there, um, I don't think Tonga will be open, so I'll have to pass that and go straight to Fiji. But all of it's kind of up in the air, and basically it's just I didn't I need to be in New Zealand by November for cyclone season. So I'm just going to see what I can and what makes sense in uh, the South Pacific up until that point. Um, let's see. Is there a risk of running a cargo ship out at sea? Yes, absolutely. I almost got ran down coming here. Uh, I don't know what the traffic's like between here and Tuamotus, but I have a new AIS system that I'm installing, so um, it'll be less of a concern. I had a working AIS system when I left LA. It stopped working about three days out, and um, so now I have a new one that I'll have dialed in. Uh, they said the Philippines is always open for you. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely be heading to the Philippines, but it's going to be a minute because I want to see New Zealand and Australia and, um, and then work my way up into Southeast Asia. Um, I would love to go to Tonga, but if they're closed, I can't, it doesn't matter if I rethink it or not. If they're not open, I can't go there. Um, uh, Robbie Mack. Yes, I'm selling Alberg 30. Oh, I want to mention real quick, uh, my little brother Scott is on here. He just went to, um, and Scott, chime in in the chat for me here, but he just went to like a motorcycle rally for an organization he was telling me about today that seems really cool that works with foster kids who kind of get kicked out of the system when they turn 18. And uh, Scott, what's the name of that? Is it Forgotten Angels? And uh, if you'll post their website in the description. So he went to this fundraiser thing um, with a bunch of bikers where they were raising money for these kids, for this organization to help kids. They get them in tiny homes and they help them get jobs and stuff. Um, and it sounded really cool. Yeah. Forgotten Angels is uh, and Scott. Scott, if you could just post that link, that'd be cool. Um, he sent me a picture of some people uh, jousting with dildos on motorcycles and said the theme of the, the meetup was um, bad people doing good things, which is pretty awesome. Um, so what else you guys have any other questions on here? Let me think, um, there you go. So yeah, you can check out that. Um, and I'll, I'll add that to, um, my, uh, to the description down below. Um, what else? Uh, any projects before oh, Mike's asking about projects before I leave the dock? Yep. Lots of projects before I leave the dock. And um, uh, let's see the big one, which, oh, actually, that's what I want to talk about real quick. And then we'll talk about the projects is Sarah, who you guys know from the channel, who's like one of my closest friends for a very long time is flying in Tuesday for a week. And, um, we're going to see some sites and I'm going to put her to work. She's going to help me install my new hydro vane. So 
uh, worked out a deal with Hydrovane and um, I'm going to be doing like R and sort of like R and D for them where they sent me an upcycled unit and um, I um, I'm going to be kind of field testing it for them. They said all the parts are like factory rebuilt. It came from their factory in the UK and um, they said a number of people had reached out to them about um, a sponsorship deal, but they don't do sponsorships. But so we worked out this thing where they had been working on this project of trying to see if they can work out upcycle units um, and to see kind of where that could go in the future. And um, so I'm going to be like test driving or upcycled one of their upcycled units. And I, it's the greatest wind vane on the planet. So I am super stoked to have the opportunity. Um, I was uh, very happy to be able to give my Salomat wind vane, which just, it just needs a little bit of rebuild. Like it needs a new spring and um, some tuning up. But I gave that to Captain Mike, who towed me in as um, a, a heartfelt thank you so much. And uh, so I'm stoked that he's going to be using that on his boat, sailing around the Hawaiian Islands until he takes off cruising. Um, so there's that. Um, Mike also gave me his old um, electric windlass. So I'm going to be installing an electric windlass on the bow. So that's got to get dialed in. And um, yeah, I got to finish up this galley thing. Um, yeah, you know, it's like clocks are ticking. So it's a, I, I've been working a lot. Uh, on all these projects, just trying to get everything done. Um, what else? Favorite meal on Oahu? That's a good question. I've been, I mean, I'm pretty uninteresting and simple when it comes to food, but um, I get a, they, there's a good impossible burger over here at Waikiki um brewery oh you know what the, my favorite meal is the goat cheese and arugula pizza at the harbor pub it is so good it is crazy good so that is fantastic oh thank you chico appreciate it that is awesome um so yeah that the pizza at the harbor you have to wait a long time to get it when you're there but it is very good um <clears throat> JP asked, uh, what's the most important lesson sailing has taught you? Patience. Patience, patience, patience. That's the key. Hello from Australia. Um, what else? Oh, thanks, you guys from the UK. Appreciate y'all being up so late watching this. What else? Let me see if I missed anything. Oh, thank you, Truthmaker. Appreciate that. Um, no, uh, you're asking about any seafood or catch anything yourself. Um, no, I'm still, I have not, uh, I'm still learning how to fish and I'm um, still waiting to get some buddies of mine took me out spearfishing, but we didn't have any luck. So I'm going to go out with them again and then they're going to teach me how to clean everything and whatnot. So that's still something I need to learn how to do. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, so what would I do if there was a war? A war with French Polynesia? Um, I'd probably sell someplace else. I don't know. Um, so he said, love your bat tattoo. Yeah, I'm like old school goth kid. Um, but I, I think beards and makeup don't go well together. So unless you're like in a black metal band. <clears throat> Hello from Maui. I love Maui. I can't wait to get over there. And hit all the anchorages around Maui and the and the islands around there. Um, uh, am I installing a water maker for the trip? No, I do not have money for a water maker. If I had money for a water maker, I would, but they're very expensive. So um, I actually, I have a rain catchment system, and I was just drawing up plans to make an additional sort of temporary bimini with a rain catchment add-on that that works even better. Um, just today, so I'll be doing that. <clears throat> Um, what else? What else? If a wizard gave me one wish, what would it be? Yeah, I don't know. Let me think on that. I'll come back to that question. Um, probably something really dumb and wasteful. 
Um, what else? Hello from Wilmington. Yep, my old stomping grounds. Eric says he's on a 24-foot dolphin. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, what else? Uh, I'm I'm at a marina in Honolulu. Your most scariest time out at sea. Um, he, uh, actually, I talked about that on the... Um, I think I talked about that on the Profoundly Pointless podcast. So I'll send you over there to hear about my scariest moment at sea. Um, Chico asked if I'd gotten any tattoos in Hawaii. No, but um, Big Island Mike's going to be tattooing a zebra dove on me soon. The problem here is like I go swimming so much that... It's like, well, do I get tattooed and not swim for a week or do I go swimming whenever I want? But yeah, Big Eye Mike's going to be giving me a zebra dove tattoo soon, which I'm excited about. Um, Corey said, any good sailing books you'd recommend, fiction or nonfiction? Yeah, I'll post. Actually, Sarah, can you post a link from my link tree of the books I love? Um Uh oh, Kate is asking me to talk about this, which I think I've talked about it before, but I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, we the Navigators, David Lewis. And um, one thing that I read the other night, which I think I'd read before, but that I found really interesting is that the it says like swells um, are generated from a far distance. And this is at sea, not close to shore swells are generated from a long distance and waves are generated by the wind. So like waves either generated by the wind or breaking on shore. But when you're at sea, there are no waves unless there are high winds creating the waves. I thought that was interesting because I tend to like think of swells and waves as kind of interchangeable, which they are not. Uh, so that was really cool thing to read. And um, I posted this, a bunch of these diagrams about deflections around islands um, from these like Polynesian um, wayfinders where it's like, it shows like how the swells react um, based on relation to land. So you can read that really far out um, and start seeing these swell patterns change before you've even seen, especially in the South Pacific where it's like low lying atolls um, where the, all you might only see like fringe of palm trees where you can start reading the sort of surface of the seas to um, know that you're, you know, so close to land. And then you use like the birds as well, because when you start seeing boobies or turns, like boobies only travel about 30 miles offshore. So you see boobies, you're like, okay, well, I'm within 30 miles of some land. And um, one other thing I read yesterday was that the, um, you can't tell from the bird activity necessarily, even if you see boobies and turns and great frigate birds, you can't necessarily tell which way land is until, unless it's sunrise or sunset. And so it says in here that um, like for great frigate birds, when it's time to roost, they go really high. They're normally like circling, looking for fish. They go really high and they just do a beeline straight for their nesting area. Um, and the same thing with boobies, but boobies go really low to the surface and they fly straight as an arrow right to their roost. So that's like, really neat and i can't wait to apply the stuff i'm learning in that book like you know in real time on the sea in the south pacific um really cool book and it's listed on that sarah just posted the um my list of a bunch of books good sailing books to check out um let me see what else Someone said, so what's this book? It's David Lewis, We the Navigators. And it's the most extensive um, like uh, account and firsthand studies with the, the, the sort of the last of the Polynesian master navigators in the 60s. And um, it is on, and David Lewis is one of my absolute heroes. He also wrote Icebird, where he took this little boat to Antarctica by himself. 
And it's like one of the most stressful books I've ever read in my life. This dude is so cool. <clears throat> um, what else? Hello from Annapolis. I'll be in Annapolis in like a week and a half. Um, I'm going to Annapolis for like five or six days. I think only five days with my travel days. Um, to the Ocean Cruising Club award ceremony, I received the Qualifiers Mug Award for my passage to Hawaii. So I'm going to accept that and meet a bunch of people. And um, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Um, asking if I have a satellite phone. I have an Iridium Go, which turns my iPhone and iPad into a sat phone, along with EPIRB. What else? What else? Someone delete Justin Davis, please, from the chat. I ain't having that shit. Um, thank you. So um, what's, let me see, what else do I need to talk about? It's beautiful here. I'm looking forward to um, Sarah coming out. We're going to go see the albatross at the very end of the island. I've gotten to go twice. Kimberly Wood took me twice. Sarah's a huge birder. Um, and my mama was a big birder. And Sarah and my mom used to always talk about birds. And um, so I learned a lot from Sarah about birds. And um, I'm stoked to take her out to see the albatross before they head out. And, um, yeah, I think we're going to find some waterfalls to get into some snorkeling and all that stuff. So. We're going to mix in a little bit of adventure with some boat work and um, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, Adam asked, any plans to sell to Australia? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I plan on being in New Zealand from uh, like November until like around April. If I can get, I'm trying to get a six month, the, the nine month visa, but I, I want to be there through cyclone season. And then I want to go to Australia and um, cruise up the um, East coast of Australia there and uh the Great Barrier Reef and everything, and then make my way up to Darwin and then over to Indonesia. Oh, hi, Kimberly. There you go. People were asking for you, Kimberly. Um, Kimberly's in the chat and um, tell her what's up. She's hiding out. I'm going to. All right. I just had to get rid of someone that I wanted to punch in the face. <clears throat> um, okay. So what is the smallest boat you've taken? What's the smallest boat you'd take across the Pacific? Lots of other proven seaworthy boats in the 20 to 27 range. How small would you go? Um, I personally have no interest in taking a boat. Like I would do, I just helped deliver a, a Triton from Kauai. And um, I am... Um, I, uh, I wouldn't take, even that boat would be a bummer to take from the mainland. Uh, just the, even the motion of my boat was, you can see in the video, in my video, how gnarly the motion was. And the smaller they get, the more extreme the motion is. So, I mean, you like, you know, I think a Triton would be fine and that's 27 foot, but, um, yeah, I have no interest in any boat. I mean, even, I didn't think I could afford a 30 foot boat when I found Tritea. So, you know, but I was looking for Tritons and um, my buddy Esteban just picked one up on Kauai and we brought it back the other day. And just, yeah, it was like, uh, it's a great boat. It sells very well, but they're just so small and light that um, they get thrown around a lot. Um, what else? It's funny, people People often ask me, they're like, um, you know, what what size boat do I need to to do this or whatever? I'm like, well, and I always say the same thing. I'm like, well, you can you can take a barrel over Niagara Falls. It doesn't mean it's a good idea. Um, and the Contiki was a raft that drifted, you know, from South America to the Marquesas. So anything's possible, whether it's comfortable, fun or safe is a different sort of conversation. 
Um, what else? Curious about my height. I'm like three foot six. I am very short. Um, what else? Yeah, like hobbits. That's why my boat looks so big inside because I'm so short. Um, have I seen any UFOs out of sea? I have not. I've seen lots and lots of satellites, uh, but no UFOs. But I came from New Mexico, so I wouldn't be surprised if I did see UFOs. Someone's asking me to make more stoner vids. Uh, I don't know how to do that. I could do like fancy tie dye, I guess. I could just wear tie dye for one whole episode. Um, green flash. Oh, I have not. Man, my burn the like retinas out of my eyeballs trying to see the green flash for many years, and I have not, not yet. I have not sailed on the Great Lakes. No, uh -uh. but I know you guys get some serious like winds and sea conditions up there with uh, the wind howling out of the north. Um, selling EV is a, is a hydro vein, an absolute important piece of gear for single hander. Doesn't necessarily have to be a hydro vein, but a uh, wind vane self steering system is 1000% absolutely crucial for sailing single handed. Unless you have a big boat with like a very reliable um, electronic steering autopilot, but then you're going to be drawing electricity 24 hours a day and you got to make sure you have spares that you trust. Um, Ryan from Ryan and Sophie just finished his passage, solo passage um, to the Caribbean. And me and him were talking. We, we talked extensively before he left about things he needed to think about doing it solo because he'd never done it solo. And he was asking me my thoughts about it. And, you know, and so, you know, he said he he had spares and everything for his because he didn't have a wind vane. He had spares and everything for his autopilot and he trusts and it got him there. No problem. So I was I was happy to hear that because that, even that like even if it goes out, it'd be a bummer to have to change out of sea where a wind vane primarily they just they just work. You know, they take people all around the world <clears throat> with no draw on electricity. Um, Scott's asking me, what's the difference between a wind vane and a hydro vane? So a hydro vane is a wind vane, but a hydro vane is a auxiliary rudder wind vane. And the other kind is the, like, I think servo pendulum where most wind vanes use the same sort of mechanics, but it uses your own rudder to steer the boat. And so if I had had one of those, I would have been completely without self steering as well. But I was always nervous and always thought that I wanted to have a spare rudder because I was actually on a delivery years ago in the Atlantic, where when we came into North, uh, South Car North Carolina, we came in and out to the Outer Banks in North Carolina, and we got outside the mark, and the we ran aground, and the captain panicked with his 75 horsepower engine and broke the rudder off. So from that moment on, I was like, I want a spare rudder, and turned out I needed a spare rudder crossing the ocean. So the hydrovane has a built-in rudder. It's self-contained. There's no wacky lines everywhere. And it's its own system, and it's an emergency rudder if something happens to your primary rudder. Would I ever like to sail in the Arctic and Northwest Passage? I would love to sail in the Arctic and Northwest Passage on a boat purpose made for that with a crew that knew what they were doing. Um, yeah, somebody reached out to me not long ago about crewing on a trip through the Northwest Passage. And I asked him about the boat and they're like, oh, we haven't bought the boat yet. And I'm like, and he wanted to do it this year. I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm not into that. Um, it needs to be a tried and true high, high latitudes boat. And, but I would love to do the Northwest Passage. Um, is snorkeling and diving hard to learn, holding your breath, relaxing underwater? Um, snorkeling is very easy to learn. Um, diving, you definitely want to get training because you can die very easily. Um, and then the same thing with free diving is you want to get training because it's easy to die free diving as well. 
but yeah, you can, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like one of the greatest things I've ever done is diving. Um, what else? What else? Scott saying pure panic when you start first starting. I know I would put my face in the water when I was trying to learn to snorkel and then I would throw my head out and, and breathe dramatically because I was so nervous about breathing with my face underwater. But once you figure it out, it's so fun. You guys got any other questions? Um, people are asking about like, things I learned the first year of sailing. This is a good moment to actually talk about sailing yacht Silky. I'm going to post their link right now. Um, a lot of times people ask me how to, I just put in their link, their link you can find in the description of this video as well, but I just put it in the chat. Um, a lot of people ask me, how can you get on boats? Can you get sailing experience? How specifically uh, ocean coastal cruising, whatever. One of the ways to do that is you can book passage on charter boats. Um, so like a customer does that for like, even does it for like heavy weather sailing. So you're a sailor and you want to get experience heavy weather. John Kretschmer does these heavy weather crazy. He goes out when it, um, 59 North, Andy Shell, they do this where they book a passage. You, you rent a berth and then you do an ocean crossing with a, a seasoned captain and crew, and then you gain experience. So I learned how to sail through under Celia Bull, uh, a female captain out of Scotland. She's English. She was like one of the top mountain climbers, female mountain climbers in the world back in the day. And um, she runs charter boat, her charter boat, Selkie, which I learned to sail on out of Scotland. And she just released her new um, calendar for this next year. Um, and I can't remember, uh, I think I can't remember how much the births are for what time period, but probably like 1500 to $2,000, depending on which one. Um, but if, you know, you think about it, it's like, you're getting, it's like a hotel stay and then they have a, someone on board preparing all the food. So you're getting all your provisions taken care of and you're getting to explore all these different areas around Scotland. Um, so if you think about it in the sense of like, a traditional vacation cost. It's not that different. And you're gaining insane real world experience from this captain. She's done Cape Horn a ton. She crewed on a boat that went to Antarctica a number of times. She sailed to South Georgia. She told me about being in 60 foot seas in South Georgia. She is a super badass. And she taught me so much. Like we anchored all over the Orkney Isles. We like just insane changed my life forever. And, um, you can you can book passage on her boat. She also, in the spring of 2023, is going to be taking the boat up Norway and exploring all the fjords of Norway. So I think they're going to go from uh, the Isle of Egg uh, to the Ork maybe to Orkney and then Fair Isle and then Shetland and then uh, or I may have switched those, but and then from there to Norway. And um, I was like looking at my calendar trying to figure out if I could leave my boat tied up someplace. <laughs> And like go do this passage to Norway with her because that would be so cool. Um, so check out her website if you want to see about getting some ocean sailing experience. Um, Celia Bull on Sailing Yacht Selkie. Incredible. And it'll it'll change your life. It'll do one of two things. It'll either you'll be like, this is what I'm going to do. I, I, I want to definitely do adventure cruising. Or you're going to be like, that was absolutely terrible. I never want to do ocean sailing again. So, yeah, check it out. Um, what else? Uh, people are saying my audio, I don't know. I think, I think it's on other people's end because everybody else is saying the audio is fine. So, um, Uh, someone asked if I got ASA certification. No, I did not. Um, uh, let me check my I'm getting text messages here. Can you guys hear me? Sarah's saying she can't hear me. It's 
Scott, can you hear me? Seems like half the people have it and half don't. So I don't know. Um, okay. What else? I talked about Selkie and... Um, Oh, someone asked about ASA. I did not get ASA training. Um, and what I'll say about the ASA training is that I think it's absolute robbery what they charge for those courses. It's completely unnecessary. And someday when I get old, I might set up a separate competing nonprofit and offer courses that have the same credentials um, for half the price because it's complete. It's absurd to me how much they charge for those courses. And, and now if you have no experience, it's a good way for someone to teach you the basics of sailing. But I think it's criminal what ASA charges for those courses, considering you don't really get anything from having the certificate other than you gain experience, that you gain confidence, and it might make you know if you want to pursue it or not. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's completely criminal what they charge for those courses. So it's absurd. And I will say that you can study, study, study. Like the only thing, only reason I even looked into an ASA course is because then you can rent charter boats in other parts of the world. They say that you can. Um, but um, the thing is, you can challenge the test. So you can do all the studying without taking the course and go to one of their testing facilities and for like 100 bucks, challenge the test. And you can just challenge them all and get the certificates. I think you do like one docking procedure or something. But you can challenge all those tests for like 100 bucks and not spend $1,000 of them like showing you how to tie dock lines totally criminal. Um, I think that sailing should be available to people that have no money as well as people that do have money. So it's, yeah, it's someday I might start a nonprofit when I'm like old and, and too frail, I might start a nonprofit to where, I, you know, people can, can get all of that same knowledge at a fraction of the cost. <clears throat> What else? Trying to see what you guys are saying. Someone's asking if I've seen Maiden Voyage. Yeah, that's a great documentary. Um, someone's asking any parts of New Zealand I want to explore. Um, I want to see all of it. Um, actually... In, um, I think it's this issue, the Ocean Cruising Club guide. Um, I think there's one of the stories in here is talking about a couple that went around all the islands in New Zealand. And um, I'm basically going to look at what they did and kind of investigate those anchorages and stuff. So um, I don't know a too terrible lot about New Zealand yet, but. Um, I was writing back and forth with Lynn Party the other day, and she invited me to come and visit her. So hopefully I'll be tying up on her dock. She's one of my greatest sailing heroes, so that would be kind of epic for me um, to sign, sail into her dock. Um, so, yeah. What else? Someone said, what in life made you to drop the norm and decide to go sail. Um, I want to see the whole world and, um, yeah, just put a plan in action and, and went for it. Um, where, oh, where's Ollie, um, asked how has life on board changed you as a person? I don't know that life on board has changed me as a person. A lot of other things that happened in my life changed me as a person, but um, I don't know that being on the boat has necessarily changed me as a person. Um, I'm probably like happier or more relaxed than I would have been. So I was asking, would I sail on a bigger boat with crew? No, I have no interest. I mean, I do yacht deliveries and stuff where I'll bring on crew, but yeah, no, it's not. Um, I'm happy sailing solo or shorthanded with like one other person that would that would be fine but now nah, i'm not interested in sailing on big boats 
Um, what else? Sorry, if I can't keep up with this chat, it goes pretty fast. I'm doing my best. Adam's asking when I'm aiming for Australia. Well, like I said, I, I plan on being in New Zealand this November through April of 2023 is next year, 2023. And then making the passage over to Australia. So I'll be there. I guess that's Australia's fall, fall of, um, after cyclone season, um, of this year. And then, uh, make my way up running, running from the winter. Someone said, bad luck to change the name of the boat. Nah, not necessarily. You can go through certain procedures and, you know, roll the dice on it. I changed the name of my boat. And, um, yeah. So, it's like, you can be superstitious about a variety of things. But it's also bad luck to have women on a boat. But I'd much rather have a woman on the boat than a man on the boat. So, there's that. <laughs> what has your been your favorite adventure so far? Mm, I'd have to break that up like in Hawaii probably Kane Ohe because the sandbar was so absolutely bananas um, but I loved the west side too and I've been I just finished writing a story about Pokai Bay going to Pokai Bay so that's fresh in my memory but I would say Kane Ohe was so cool that was probably my favorite adventure on Oahu so far Oh, Scott said, there's a good question. I keep in pests off the boat, insects and others. There's not, you just kind of hope for the best. Um, every, everything I've read, everyone I've talked to, eventually when you're in the tropics, you end up getting roaches and you just battle them the best you can. Um, there's no real kind of foolproof way to do it. You'll see actually on big cargo ships and stuff, when they're anchored into ports, they'll have these giant circles that hang over the dock lines with a slit in it. And that's to keep rats from running up the dock line onto the boat. So you, you could probably do a small version of that, but you're so close at a dock that a rat could just jump on. So rats are the worst case scenario because they eat through electronics. But yeah, it's just you just kind of deal with it as it happens because it's going to happen. Uh, Mike's asking if heavy fog is a serious concern on a long passage only in places where there is fog. So like Southern California has fog. If you're sailing kind of north of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, especially towards Alaska, there's a lot of fog. But in the tropics, there's no fog. Where's Ali? Do you rely mostly on electronics on board or is he adapted to books and sextant? And they're like, um, yeah, I have a, I have a really nice sextant. I don't know. It's not accessible. I have a beautiful sextant that I know how to use and all the books that go with it. Um, I need to refresh before I leave. Um, I'm also planning on trying to sit down and interview with the, um, one of the Polynesian wayfinders, um, on Hokulea, I believe is the, the Hawaiian voyaging canoe. I'm going to try to meet up with those guys and see if I can interview them on camera talking about it. And that's another thing I'm, why I'm studying this book is to practice like, you know, Polynesian star, like star navigation. Um, pretty simple from here to the two Motus and to Tahiti. Um, basically, you just keep the Southern Cross on your bow and uh, you keep sailing to it. And eventually um, you hit the two Motus. So. Um, but there are definitely stars that sit over each of the different island groups that I'd like to learn. And even though I'll be using GPS and, uh, and that traditional stuff and even have a satellite tracker so everybody can follow along, I'll be applying those every step of the way as well so that I can learn it just out of an interest in the craft. Someone said, watch free and sailing. Yeah, if you watch my passive video, I'm wearing one of their shirts on my passive video. I love their channel.
What else? Someone asked what alcohol do I take? Um, I'm sober. I don't I don't drink alcohol, so I'm a cheap date. Someone said, How big is my drone? I have a Mavic 2. That is sad. I need to make sure she still works before I leave because I crash landed her on the ocean passage. She worked for all the trips around here, but she was acting weird last time I was at when I was at Kaneohe. <clears throat> mm, what else? Um, yes, I do keep alcohol on board that people give me. I have like a nice bottle of rum for guests or whatever. Um, I think I have some of John Conway from, um, uh, uh, selling Florian. I think I have, he, uh, his family owns a wine company. I think I have a bottle of their wine, but just for guests. Um, Robert California is asking about the Unilad thing. Yeah, I talked about it earlier. Um, about the Unilad craziness. Someone's asking about pirates. There are no pirates. There are pirates in Somalia, and there are some pirates near, like, Malaysia, if you sail alone at night. Pirates are an imaginary boogeyman. Um, they're not an issue. Uh, there are bandits, localized bandits. Like, it's not necessarily safe to sail around the um, Papua New Guinea and stuff. But a lot of that has to do with like they're under such great poverty that, you know, they're trying to steal to supply their livelihood, which doesn't justify it. Doesn't mean it's OK, but there's a big difference between pirates and bandits. Um, same thing. And I've mentioned this before, like S.B. Delos, when they were in Madagascar, they had someone try to steal their dinghy in the middle of the night. That's those aren't pirates. They're just bandits. <clears throat> What else? What else? Um, let me see. What time is it? How long have we been in here? I better check these texts. Um, someone said Kimberly is on. Yeah, I don't know. Kimberly may have fallen asleep. She might still be on here. She's in uh, Tofu in Mozambique. And um, she popped on earlier and said hi, but it's like 4 a.m. for her. Asking about whales, killer whales coming too close to me. Nope. I've had I've had killer whales on delivery in 2015. We had orcas surface right next to us and hang out with us for an hour. Three babies, two adults. Um the only place in the world there's documentation of killer whales interacting with ships and it's specifically attacking ships' rudders is right off of um, the uh, coast of Gibraltar, like that strait. I can't remember the name of that strait. Strait of Gibraltar, maybe? Um, and my guess is that someone injured one of those whales, a fishing boat, or somebody did something to those whales, and they attacked it, and they've been attacking boats ever since because they're very, very smart creatures. And there's also no accounts of orcas killing a human in the wild ever recorded anywhere. So they're really smart. And um, it's it seems like there's one pod off that, off that one specific region that's attacking ships, but it doesn't happen anywhere else yet. Yeah, SeaWorld is not in the wild. <clears throat> Hello from Romania. That's awesome. Um, that's cool seeing people from all over. Appreciate y'all. What else? Y'all got any other questions? Somebody's asking about keeping weapons on board, a flare gun and, um, my fists. No pets on board. Nope, nope. It's really hard to have pets on board when you're sailing to the places like the South Pacific and other countries because um, 
you know, it's like, you can't, you can't take them ashore or there's like, like extreme quarantine and they're concerned about you bringing stuff and decimating their local wildlife. So really hard. Jesse Timbers asking about any tattoos to honor my passage from Cali. Not yet. I will. I think I'm still processing it, but, um, yeah, I have lots of little like tattoos from different past passages, um, little anchor tattoos, but that one was kind of heavy. So I got to think on that one for a minute. If I, somebody asked if I'd seen any mermaids, um, no, because if I did, I'd be drowned in What else? Um, what else? You guys got anything? Favorite book reading experience on board. I'm really, when I do, I save this book just for passage making, The Boundless Sea. It's crazy fascinating. It's almost like, I mean, look how thick that thing is. It's like kind of an absurd history of the sea. I got, look, I got a postcard from the Oland Islands in there. Um, yeah, this book is really, it's pretty, it's not, it's pretty dry. <laughs> Um, but this is what I read when I'm on passage making mostly. Um, and then I got this book the other day, which I'll probably use when Sarah comes to visit ancient sites of Oahu. Um, so I'd like to visit as many of the hay owls as I can while I'm here. And this has them and the fish ponds and stuff. Also, here's another go-to, you know, keep it light. You know what I mean? Oh, you know what? That's what I forgot to mention, actually. I just shot, which you guys, some of y'all might um, enjoy this. Oh, Metal's on. Hello, Metal. Um, I just shot a video. I don't know what it's going to be titled yet, but it's something like what I learned solo sailing. Uh, what I learned on my first solo sailing passage. And I sat down. It's kind of a long video. I think it's like 40 minutes long. but I go through everything that I learned on the passage that were things I didn't know before or things that I thought were going to be different maybe. Um, so that video is coming out pretty soon. And um, I think that'll, and I want to get it out before people start doing their passages for the season to Hawaii to maybe give them a little perspective about whatnot. Um, and I will be doing a sort of extensive tell all about what it's like to arrive to to Hawaii by sailboat um, as far as like the bureaucracy goes and anchorage limits and all that stuff. But I'm actually not going to release that video until I leave because um, I'm going to tell some tr truths in that video. So that'll be coming out when um, I'm ready to push off and head for French Polynesia. Somebody keeps asking my scariest situation faced at sea. Um, I talk about it in the pointless, uh, profoundly pointless podcast. Um, you can head over and check it out. I talk about that very subject on that podcast. Jesse asked, how is your emotional and mental health since you arrived in Hawaii? Um, it's day to day actually. And that I mentioned earlier, I just did a podcast with like 104 FM in Dublin this, these hosts are Trish and Kev. They were really nice. And uh, their show is Room 104. And actually, I think I talked more about the emotional side of things with them than I have at all than I have at all since the passage video. But um, it's day to day. I have days where I'm dark. I have days where I'm sad and confused as to what happened to my life. Um, it is still very sad and heartbreaking. Thank you, Truthmaker. Um, it is very hard 
and um, I'll probably maybe always be confused as to what happened, but maybe that doesn't matter. Uh, so yeah, I'm still just trying to like heal and like think through things and, you know, just be a better person myself. And um, yeah, I mean, on one hand it helps a lot because like I made my dreams come true and they came true in an incredible way that I had worked hard for. Some of the other day mentioned that I was lucky for the life I have, but there was no part of my life has to do with luck. No one handed me anything. No one even presented me with any opportunities or anything. Like I built everything I have and my dear friends and family helped me along the way, as far as like, you know, my short team and stuff when I got into in a situation, but nothing to do with my life has to do with luck. It has to do with my, like me busting my ass and giving up a lot of conveniences. But so in one way is like the emotional aspect is offset a little by all the, you know, all my other dreams coming true, but um, it's definitely, I, you know, I definitely wake up some nights from like very realistic dreams um, of Camille and it sucks. <laughs> it still sucks. So yeah. And I only wish her the best. Um, we haven't spoken. The only time she spoke to me was when she asked me to sign divorce papers. Um, so, you know, that's like a long gone subject. Um, but yeah, it sucks. But I definitely think that, um, certain parts of it are easier because of the fact that I am living my dream, even though it's, you know, sometimes it's scary and it's hard. Like this place is very expensive and, um, yeah. So there are certain things that are scary about it, but, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's just a long, I think it's going to be a long road to healing as far as the heartache stuff goes. What else? Oh, somebody asked, uh, do you think, do you keep your mental and emotional health together when sailing alone for weeks? Do you have a sat phone? Do you talk to anyone? Um, I did have a sat phone. I made a couple calls, but the talking on a sat phone is kind of a nightmare. So there wasn't much of that. Oh, thank you. Kane, um, but yeah, yeah, I can, I can talk about this actually. So I don't, I don't know. Actually, I spoke about this on this podcast coming up, so I can, I feel like I can talk about it. Um, when I left, I, um, I was completely devastated and, um, I knew the boat was sound. I knew everything was ready to go. And, um, I only told a couple of people, mostly just my brothers and really close friends who are like family to me. And, um, I remember I gave myself like, I said two weeks, but it ended up being 12 days because of a weather window. But I was like, I'm going to give myself two weeks to make sure my head is right before I do this. So I'm not doing something foolish. And then, and then I did it. I pushed off and I was concerned about being in sort of like, self-isolation or like solitary self-imposed solitary confinement after having such my life completely shatter into a million pieces but the one of the main factors um is that when i lost when, when me and my brothers lost our mama in 2013 i like buried myself into a relationship i was in at that time and kind of hid from the grief and didn't address the grief i could not accept the fact that my mom was no longer in existence. So, and then when that relationship ended and I had to actually deal with the grief back then, it was much worse. It was very devastating. And I was, I was very suicidal. Um, having my mom, you know, before it's like, I never, I was able to like offset suicidal thoughts when I was younger because I was like, well, I would never do that to my mom. And then when she was gone, I was like, well, you know, and this is like before I had any kind of future on the horizon and before I'd even gotten into sailing. And um, so, you know, that was like a scary thing. And um, 
I think that I had made it worse on myself by hiding from the grief. So in this situation, when I lost Camille, um, I was like, well, I'm just going to do the kind of extreme opposite where I just sit with it and like, you know, try to understand it and just try to move forward. So, um, I would do the same thing again. I think it sucked no matter what. So, but it, it was almost easier to just try to like muscle through it. than if I had been, you know, in California where I have friends who love me and, and my brothers and, you know, people like distracting me and, and making sure that I was okay. So yeah, I don't think I definitely would do it again, the same thing, but I hope, I hope I don't ever have to do that again, but yeah. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Scott mentioned it's almost been 10 years since we lost our mama, which is crazy. She would, uh, My mom would have hated me being a sailor. She had liked all the localized stuff, and she had liked watching all the pictures of the fish and stuff, but um, she would have, it would have stressed her out so bad, me doing ocean crossings. Um. What else? Someone's asking about the COVID and testing. Um, I'm fully vaccinated with a booster. I have been the whole time. And um, I'm just going to places that uh, allow that, um, allow me to go and uh, go from there. The There's a really amazing website. Um, actually, Sarah, will you post this website called Noonsight? I think it's noonsight.org. Um, yeah, if Sarah, if you'll look that up, noon site, and they break down all of the sort of like each country's like entrance requirements nowadays. That's also an amazing website for cruisers because as far as like crime, people are talking about bandits and pirates earlier. As far as crime goes, you can go to any country and look at what the known sort of thing will, they'll have accounts of people being robbed in different places or how safe a place is and, and how dangerous a place is, um, and all this stuff. So that website is really cool. The only bummer about that site is it feels like it was made in almost 1998 or something. I wish some young people would get on board with that site and turn it into an app that was really user-friendly because it's real clunky the way it's set up, but it is a wealth of knowledge and it's free to use. Oh yeah, my little brother said that mom would have been senseless for buying and riding motorcycle. Yeah, she, our mom, uh, Wanda Thorpe, she's Wanda Brown, and uh, when she, her maiden name, she raced motorcycles, flat track, in the men's division in the 70s, because there weren't enough women in the women's division, so she raced motorcycles, she like did roller skate dancing competitions, our mom was a super badass. Yeah, so Sarah posted that noon site, really, really cool website. Appreciate you guys signing on here. It's 412. You guys board it. There's some big boat coming in. Make sure they don't hit my solar panels. <laughs> um, what else? Biggest, uh, Mike asked me, biggest skill improvement since you pushed off the dock in L.A.? Um, cooking at sea. For sure. Someone's asking what food I take with me. I take a lot of dry stuff, a lot of, like, stuff that's easy to prepare. Um, and I'm kind of, like, pre-repeating myself. I talk about a lot of this on this upcoming podcast. But um, lots of beans and rice. I love Japanese curry and fresh rice. Um, like things like bread don't last very long. So tortillas are really good to have because you can make quesadillas or, or burritos and stuff. The tortillas last a lot longer than bread does. The fresh stuff goes pretty quick. And um, I have a fridge, but it's pretty small. So, yeah, I the main thing is like to have enough easy stuff because it's very difficult to cook at sea. Yeah, the, the swell always got gnarly when I got time for dinner. 
Somebody said, what would you like better, sailing alone or with somebody? And in regards to like doing ocean crossings, um, I would much rather be alone because I've said it before, like I'm comfortable being uncomfortable. And if I was had somebody on board taking up space who was miserable and complaining and whining and couldn't help or they were just miserable, it would make the environment so toxic that I would much rather just do ocean crossings by myself, but I'd much rather do coastal exploration of islands and stuff with somebody else. It's much more fun to show people, to be experienced, beautiful, amazing things with someone and be like, oh my God, can you believe how cool this is? So it's like 50, 50 of one or the other. <laughs> Mike's talking shit on there. I love you, Mike. Um, what else? Uh, someone asked, uh, MRE is good or too expensive? Actually, Patagonia Provisions is going to be sponsoring my next passage. So they're, they're going to send me a big box of goodies to check out and talk about on video. So we'll see. Their stuff seems really cool. And, um, yeah, they're they're pretty stoked on sending me a bunch of stuff to check out, so I'm excited for that. Um, someone said, "Can we see the view where you are?" Sure, yeah, I'll do that. You guys want to see the view? Actually, I actually cleaned the boat, so I'm not too. Can't get too far away from the. Um, I can't get too far away from the Wi-Fi. Mm. What else? Someone said, "Do you have any plans to start doing sailing trips or exploring where you will have people pay you to take them sailing?" No, I'll never. I have no interest in doing charter stuff. Um, Trite is my forever boat, and she's too small for people coming on and sailing with me that I'm not slow dancing with. So um, unless you're slow dancing with me or you're one of my brothers, chances are, um, yeah, I'm not going to be having people on this boat. Someone asked if I surf. Um, I don't have to know how to surf. I'm very good at skateboarding and good at snowboarding, but I don't like sitting out in the water waiting my turn for long periods of time. It makes me insane. Um, so yeah, I don't, I'm wasting all this great Waikiki surf, literally steps from my boat. Someone asked, what do I think of an Albert 30? I think it's the greatest boat ever. Just make sure your rudder's good. Um, I'm not going to get a bigger boat. <laughs> this is my forever boat. I love this book. Um, somebody asked if it was scary traveling to Hawaii. Not, not scary. There were parts, I mean, there were parts where I was like maybe scared, but mostly more like alarmed or concerned. Um, that was, that was, especially after the rudder failure, I went into like survival mode. So it was more of like, I was concerned. Um, the only time I was like, I kind of was like, oh shit, it was like when I was in the water trying to dive on the boat the second time and my arms pinged out and I was like, realized I wasn't going to be able to get myself back on board if I didn't get back on board right away. So that was like, oh shit, I got to get out of here. Someone asked if I found out what hit the bottom of my boat. There's no way to know what hit my boat. My guess, my best guess is that it was a sea container because of the red mark on my rudder and the chip out of it. What else? We've been going on 
hour and 20 minutes. Maybe we can button it up. You guys have any more questions? Any more questions? Do I miss LA? Absolutely not. I love LA. It will always be my real hometown. I grew up in Hobbs, New Mexico, but my real hometown is Los Angeles. I lived there about 20 years this last time. I lived there a couple times, but the last time was 20 years. I love that city, but no, I do not miss it. Someone asked if I have a concern about sailing in the Indian Ocean down the road. Oh, yeah, for sure. But mostly it's just a matter of, like, you sail in the correct season, you watch your weather windows, and at least there's islands to hop between in the in the Indian Ocean. But it's a serious ocean, so you definitely got to, like, plan your trips and be ready to batten it down. Oh, Kimberly's asking if I plan to bring anything with you to trade or gift to people in places that are very remote. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to stock up on like lots of school supplies and stuff for kids. Um, I've been reading different books about things that are good to, to bring to trade or to give as gifts. And um, like lots of like, I'll buy a ton of like fishing hooks and um, different things. I actually reached out to the company Goal Zero that make these like rechargeable lantern solar lights. I reached out to them and was like, if you guys want to send me any number of your lights to give away um, in the South Pacific, I'd be happy to do so. I didn't hear back from them, but something like that, where it's like something that would help these, these isolated communities. Um, I would, yeah, for sure be taking stuff, you know, to trade and to, to give as gifts. Oh, someone said deflated soccer balls to trip to Africa. Yeah. That's I've read that that's really good as well. What else? Um, someone said, not morbid, but what do you want to be remembered? Legacy? Um, uh, I want to be remembered as somebody that encouraged other people to go sailing or even not just go sailing, but just chase your dreams or to connect with nature, see beautiful things, to be amazed. Like it doesn't even have to be like, you know, even if you don't have the budget for doing something as absurd as what I'm doing, go walk in a pasture and look at insects. And if you can find like excitement and passion from seeing beautiful things, or unique things or wildlife, like the thing that excites me the most is wildlife. So, you know, on any scale, like that's what I want people to be like, Oh yeah, that dude encouraged me to like pursue, you know, a long hike and seeing gorgeous things that and camping every night for a week, you know, like that's, that's all I really want. Is Maytel asking something? Let's see. Is your dreams in your dreams, are you on land or boat slash sea? Um, the um, that's a that's a good question, actually, Mittal. Um, a very funny thing that happened was actually most of my dreams now. I dream about past work events. So I worked as an art handler for like twenty years, and I'll regularly have dreams where I'm in, literally just installing art and there's no drama happening, but I'm like working out problems in my head about installing art in a gallery or a museum or in a private residence. Like half of my dreams are like work, old work dreams. But when I was at sea and I, and I, it's pretty obvious why it happened, but I constantly had dreams that I was too close to land. And I would, I was like 20 days from California and having dreams that I was going to like, that I was sailing close to land. And that so much of that is because I know that I was sleep, you know, sailing solo, you sleep, no one's on watch. So, so much of that is just like, I'm just barreling towards nothing, which there was, you know, not really a concern because land was still so far away, but that was like the dream that happened at sea. Um, 
What else? Someone said, do I need to share a story about my tattoos? Yeah, I've actually been working on doing like an episode about tattoos and the history of tattooing and how it relates to sailing and just the history of body modification. Um, because I get so much shit from trolls on my channel about my tattoos um, that. Um, and maybe sometimes people just haven't been exposed to people with tattoos. So maybe they have like honest questions that are actually offensive, but they don't mean for them to be offensive. So I would like to make a video where I talk about the history of tattooing, especially in relation to sailing. And not only that, but like French Polynesian, like the Polynesians <clears throat> all over, you know, have been getting tattooed and other cultures for centuries, you know, and people look at me and they're like, you know, oh, you're, you're just a piece of trash. You, you know, you can't get a job or whatever. It's just bananas. But, um, I have been writing up like a bunch of key points and I might sit down with like Big Alan Mike or Sean Barber sometime and film an interview where we talk about the history of tattooing and body modification and how it relates to sailing. Thank you so much for the donation. Pay them all. P-Mall, really appreciate it. Um, what else? What else? Oh, I'm not getting down on myself at all. <laughs> um, let me see if I'm missing anything here. What is the best improvement you've made to your boat? My hard dodger. 1000% the hard dodger is the best thing I ever made for my boat, for sure. Oh, Kimberly said she's excited for mine and Sarah's adventures next week. I can't wait to take Sarah to see the albatross. Super stoked. Have you guys been checking out Kimberly Wood's channel? Um, Sarah, will you post a link to Kimberly's YouTube channel? She's been doing her vlogs. She's doing a great job editing. She just started learning how to edit and stuff, and she's been doing a fa fantastic job um, editing these little vlogs of her time in Mozambique. And she's going to be in Africa for a while and um, showing us everything she sees there. So definitely head over to her channel and subscribe and check it out. Check out her videos. Um, and I'll add that link to the description of this video after the chat is done as well. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I like that. Look at that fancy uh, emoji guy with sunglasses. Um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, and I'll say it wrong. Um, Sinan? Thank you so much. There are some real trolls on here tonight. That is like one of the um, trickiest things for me is like I've uh, me and Sarah talked about this the other day. I've learned how to be very diplomatic, um, which is does not come naturally for me. I'm a punk rocker. And um, a lot of my conversations when I was young that I didn't agree with, like ended up with fists. So um, <laughs> it's like such a different modus operandi to be old and to um have to ignore people that say terrible things to me every day. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's funny. It is a, a wild thing. Yeah, exactly. My little brother doesn't have to be nice. He can, he can handle them for me. Um, who's your inspirational sailing influence? Um, number one, probably sailing hero is Hal Roth. Um, I love that dude. And, um, I think his name is, his wife's name is Margaret. Um, yeah, they're kind of my, my top heroes for sailing. 
And then Lynn and Larry Party, more so like Lynn Party is kind of more of my hero because she's a writer and a sailor. Um, the Smeetons are two of my heroes. John Kretschmer. Um, yeah. Lots of people from the 60s, though. A lot of that. Like, that's mostly the stuff I read is the stuff from the 60s. Kimberly's asking if I ever thought about release my log books as an audio format. Um, yeah, maybe. But then there would be like a long account of me mispronouncing everything in my own book. So I'm phonetically challenged. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, they just posted Kimberly's YouTube in the chat. So you guys should check that out. Um, I guess that's the other thing I could talk about a little bit. So I had, um, so I'm in the ocean cruising club and they make this publication, which I think is actually the print version is only available for members, but I had, um, an article about my passage in the most recent and this issue. Um, yeah, so like a nice full color article in it. And um, the uh, I just finished writing another article that I'm submitting for the next publication of that um, about my trip to Pokai Bay. And um, I think that that I've already written three three articles that I've been submitting about my adventures in Hawaii. And I think eventually I'll do kind of long stories about each of my anchorages that I visit. And I'll publish that as a stories book after all this said and done, similar to my six nights on the hook from Santa Cruz Island, my first sailing book that I published. I think that I'll probably do like a Hawaiian adventures book. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the way the article came out last night. And um, yeah, I'm going to get that sent off for submission for them. Someone said, how much have you spent on your tattoos? Like the great majority of my tattoos were bartered for. Um, so, and it just turns out that I know some of the best tattooers in the world. So it works out for me. But um, yeah, the great, you know, the great majority of them, I know how to build things or I know I had services that I could offer tattooers that they needed. And um, so we traded for what, you know, what I could do versus, you know, tattooing. Uh, like, so I, I got a lot of tattoos from Kat Von D when she, when she had already been tattooing a while, but she was before she was on TV show. And, um, I met Kat, I think she was in her early twenties when I met Kat and, um, she didn't have a website. So I built her first website and maintained her website until the television channel took it over. So I kept her website up and added stuff all the time. And she tattooed me once a month. So I got a ton of tattoos from Kat early on. And then Tommy Montoya, um, like, uh, he hooked me up early on, uh, before he was on New York Inc. <laughs> just happened to be that I knew all these tattooers in LA who are just phenomenal tattooers. And then Sean Barber. And then Sean started doing, Sean did most of my torso and my back piece. And, um, he, um, he's a, primarily he's a painter, a fine art painter. And, um, he was having big shows in Europe, I think. So, I built crates for him and packed up all of his paintings and got those shipped to Europe and helped him with all that stuff in trade for tattoos. And then also um, I took all of his paintings to San Francisco for the Lyle Tuttle um, 70th birthday shebang in San Francisco and installed all his paintings and then deinstalled them and took them all back. So I love the barter system trade system and a lot of my tattoos come from that system. Someone asked, how much did I pay for my boat initially? I paid $2,400 for my boat. What else? What else? You guys have any more questions? How many people are on here right now? Well, there's a lot of y'all. 119 for a, still hanging out. That's fun. 
I ain't got another. I cleaned the boat today, um, organized a bunch of stuff, and uh, other than that, I just got to make dinner. You guys, did you guys like the little yacht deliveries video last week? Tomorrow's video is the second part of the yacht deliveries video where me and uh, Esteban, who's a 22 year old sailor, um, we brought his 1959 Triton that he just bought. We brought it from Kauai to Oahu. And um, boy, it was like that, that channel is pretty gnarly, but we lucked it. We, well, we didn't luck out. We planned it very specifically with like slack trade winds. So we wouldn't get our asses handed to us because the channel is really rough. But the problem with that is like, you know, then you don't have quite as much wind as you'd like to pin you down. So it's like, you know, six of one half dozen of another, but I got seasick. I, that's the first time I've thrown up at sea in a very long time, but I threw up twice on my night watch on the passage. And, um, yeah, I felt terrible, but, um, it's just so lumpy and that boat's so little and like wobbly and everything that, um, yeah, I felt like crap, man. But, uh, that video comes out tomorrow on YouTube. Um, someone asked what the interior mod you regret or have done differently. I have zero regrets of any modifications I've done to the boat because I really, really thought things through. And um, yeah, I have absolutely zero. I guess the only thing that is a bummer, which I have to fix, um, is I bought this nice deep sink and I didn't realize that it would set right at the water line. So when I'm heeled over, water comes way up. I have to shut the seacock. So there's like water that sits like low in the drain. And if the boat's heavily laden down, then the water will come up into the sink. So that sucks. I need to fix that. I need to get a shallower sink, I think. But that's the only thing. Other than that, all my, I'm stoked. I haven't, I have no regrets on anything I've done to my boat. Uh, someone asked if I'll be recording all my journeys. Yeah, for sure. I'll be making vlogs of every everything I do everywhere I go, as well as writing. Like for me, the writing career is the long game. Um, you know, YouTube could just kind of fall out at any point. I'll always document what I'm doing as long as I have equipment to do so um, or funds to keep traveling. So, yeah, I'll always document it. But for me, writing is a sort of the long game for me. Someone asked if I think age could be a limiting factor. There's, it just depends on the physicality of what you're trying to do. There's, um, I read the book from the Hiscox where as they got later in years, they actually, they built and they built all of their boats, but they actually downsized their boat from like, I think like a 45 foot boat to like a 30 foot boat. Um, because as they got older, it was harder for them to handle that much boat. Um, so there's ways to kind of work around it. Also nowadays with like electric winches and stuff that can add to the ability to kind of sail longer, um, as you get, uh, older. Someone asked, what kind of computer do I edit with? Um, I just had to buy a new MacBook Air um, because my computer, the keyboard finally went out. It was on its last legs anyway, and I didn't even realize how terrible the editing experience was for me. But I just had to buy a new computer because this is my job, so I have to have a way to edit. Um, I love this new computer, um, and I, I moved from editing on Premiere to Final Cut Pro. And because there's no subscription series with Final Cut Pro, and um, it's a dream. It's like the first video I edited, it's like I have to get re I started editing on Final Cut, but now I'm relearning this new version. And the first video I output in Final Cut rendered in six minutes or something. And I thought something was wrong. I was like, oh, it didn't render. Because the old one, it would take two or three hours to render a video. So it blows my mind how quickly they render. <clears throat> Someone asked if I lean more to the left or the right. Well, I usually sit on the port side, so I'm going to say the left side.
I tried putting a check valve in the sink and it didn't, it didn't help. Thank you, um, Scott, for um, policing these trolls. Thank you, Gary. Really appreciate the donation. Awesome. Very, very grateful. Um, you guys have any other questions? It's so fun. There's still so many people on here after an hour and 40 minutes. That's awesome. I don't get a lot of company, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to get to hang out. Um, do I use a shortwave radio? I do not. I want to buy one of those Yacht Boys. Those are pretty cool. And you can get on the cruisers and and stuff, and they're small. Um, I think you can get them for like 80 bucks on eBay. They're called Yacht Boys. Also, the name's good. It's funny. Um, so, yeah, I might get one of those. But I did get all of my weather and everything through um, Iridium Go. Yeah, my moderators are really got their hands full with trolls today. Um, Shane's asking about, do I change sides of the berth depending on the tack? Um, I always stay on this berth. My other berth is a very short berth, and I end up, last passage, I had my life my emergency life raft there because I only have one that comes in a cloth bag, so I can't keep it on deck. So I had that there. I had my anchor actually stowed over there and a bunch of stuff. So to balance the weight, I balanced a bunch of heavy weight stuff there to balance my body weight. So just on the other tack, I'm just against the lee cloth. Um, I'm, uh, I'm tied up in Honolulu and I'm not sure what's for dinner tonight. I got to see what's in my cupboards. I, I got some vittles the other day, but I kind of been eating the same things over and over again. Uh, somebody asked about raspberry pie AIS. I don't have any experience with those raspberry pies, but they seem really cool and pretty functional and a good option, but I personally don't have any experience with them, so I'm not sure. Somebody said my Dakota lithium batteries look amazing. Oh, I'm so stoked on the Dakota batteries. Super stoked. Andrew said, going to Oahu next month. Uh, yeah, if you're around, shoot me an email, and um, if, I'm, if I'm around and not, uh, not off island or Depends on when you're here, but hit me up and um, we'll grab lunch. Um, somebody said their audio is failing. Uh, Sarah, Scott, will you tell them how to... Oh, Sarah, will you tell them what you did to fix your audio? Thank you, Kimberly. I hope you go surf today. Looks like you might go. Oh, you're going back to sleep. Um, thanks for popping in, Kimberly. I'll talk to you later. Uh, somebody asked what happened to my field recorder. Um, it's a known issue with that brand of the Sony and it's an expensive field recorder, but it's a known issue where the, the I think the power boards go out on them. So hopefully my buddy, um, I'm going to send it to my friend in New York, who's like an electronics wizard and um, hopefully he'll be able to fix it or at least extract the audio recordings I have on there for me.
Well, it looks like people are having audio issues. Maybe I should tap out. It's one hour and 45 minutes in. Thanks so much, guys, um, for joining me. I appreciate it. And um, there's links down in the in the description and um, about some of the stuff we talked about and um, lots of stuff coming up. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have a feature coming out in Cruising World Magazine uh, for the, I think it's the May issue, written by David Blake Fisher of Sailing Delilah. Um, I have some articles that I'm going to be writing in the near future for Good Old Boat Magazine um, and um, some other silly news that I can't talk about right now. But, um, and uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for hanging out. I want to thank everybody for the donations and um, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, very expensive here and the YouTube income is very all over the place. So thank you so much. Thanks to my patrons for your continued support. And I hope everyone enjoys the videos. And um, yeah, it was great hanging out with you guys. So thanks and uh, fair winds until next time.